there is a lot, lot to say, I'll be brief, nevertheless. Uh, my work basically focuses on, uh, broadly speaking, I would say energy and environment. And in energy, the focus is on energy efficiency uh, and its implementation. And uh, in the environment, the, the work relates to uh, effects of technology or mitigating the adverse effects of technology on the environment or technologies to mitigate adverse environmental effects on people. Uh, in the latter, I would say things such as uh, cleaning uh, water of pathogens and chemical contaminants to make it safe for drinking and prices and costs that are affordable to local people. Uh, in the former, uh, in terms of technology the effects on the environment, I would include topics such as uh, fuel efficient and clean burning cookstoves for people who use collected wood for cooking and then there's a lot of smoke inhalation and some kind of deforestation. So that's, that's a broad area, a lot of interest in a lot of topics. Uh, during my graduate student days when I was studying uh, towards my PhD in physics, uh, one of which was the state of emergency declared in India by Indira Gandhi. And it disturbed me so greatly to see democracy disappear before my eyes in my home country it, it, at the level of intensity that upset me and at the level of intensity of being disturbed that I didn't imagine I would have which brought home to me the point that there was something I was taking for granted about eventually things working out all right for people who are less fortunate than I was and that assumption that it will be all right for them in the long run was misplaced not just politically, not that something I could do about, but it brought me to face what I really cared about in a way that was very intense. The second, uh, second event, I would say, for me was my carefully reading a book that had just come out, out of MIT at that time, uh, by Meadows and Meadows, called Limits to Growth. And that book, quantitatively demonstrated at that time that uh, I mean, anybody who does computer simulation, and that's what I was doing uh, academically uh, of physical systems, complex systems, understands what these people attempted to do and what they attempted to test was are we running the planetary systems in a way that is long term sustainable so long as there is a commitment to indefinite growth an indefinite increase in prosperity and while you could imagine that it is obvious that it is not so the question was when will the bubble pop and it became clear that the bubble will likely pop within our lifetime and that was the second sense that brought home to me rather forcefully that Indians could never hope to achieve the level of prosperity and consumption of material resources that Americans had even in 1970s because that much burden will be unbearable for the planet. And that kind of shook me in some sense to realize that what I was seeing in the US, great prosperity and opulence, was by physical, physical limits on the carrying capacity of Earth's ecosystems, never ever going to be attainable for vast majority of Earth's population, including Indians. That was a, that was another thing like getting punched in the stomach. Okay. These two things brought me to realize that I really care not so much about discovering the next grain of truth in in basic science, but about what's the impact on immediate future of of what we do with technology and brought me slowly 
to transition from physics through computational fluid mechanics, through applied computational fluid mechanics, coming to uh, eventually doing environmental engineering. Long story. I think the single major challenge, there are many, many challenges, the single major challenge the world faces is that of sustainability. That indefinite growth of prosperity is against the laws of physics on a finite planet. And uh, you could argue that, uh, sure, we'll manage population somehow, and it's also possible that we'll manage uh, to not have indefinite physical growth of consumption. Uh, but currently we are not in that trajectory. Uh, sustainable development is attainable to the point where you recognize that some dimensions of development need to be not continuously increasing material consumption. So think of an ecosystem of a complex forest and that ecosystem also evolves but in a way that is sustainable in its material demands on the, on the immediate supporting ecosystems too. Right? That is certainly possible. Evolution is possible. All these things are possible so long as you don't keep on running out of planetary boundaries. You don't keep on crossing planetary boundaries. Like how much CO2 can you accumulate? How much toxic pollutants which are, uh, which are very long life? Like what are the persistent organic pollutants, pops? They accumulate in the environment to the point where now we find uh, fluorinated hydrocarbons in the blood of polar bears, right? Where do you stop? How long will it accumulate? So these are, these are kind of questions which are not inevitable while you can have development. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm uh, not going to resist the quip that says it's, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. I can't predict what the next big crisis could be. It could again be a financial meltdown and jam up of the world's financial system, which is also be a disaster, right? So I don't want to predict what the next big crisis is. But it's obvious that as we push more and more into uh, climate change, world's hydrological cycles change, large droughts appear, extreme events in the climate appear, our agricultural systems, our food systems, our water uh, reliance, doesn't have enough resilience to deal with long droughts, for example, or to, to operate in ways that uh, are resistant to global climate change. I don't think so. I think, I think there is this very serious risk that the first of the large crises, uh, and there's a whole series of them getting worse and worse, would all arise out of just CO2 accumulation well before uh, we poison our uh, ecosystem with uh, persistent organic pollutants, well before we deplete our fisheries, well before we damage in many other ways our diversity of uh, biological seed stocks, so many possible threats. The first immediate large scale threat which would threaten lives of tens of millions, maybe a hundred million people on that order is global climate change and its consequences. Uh, it's, it's hard to put finger on one single item. Uh, there is research and there is research. So, for example, uh, there are people doing really good, high quality, millions of dollars worth of research in improved methods to uh, finite element methods to, to predict earthquake resistance of buildings. 
Now that's such a foundational thing that will eventually go into design of better skyscrapers or better bridges or better civil structures. And it will protect the common man from being crushed in earthquake. But it's not going to be handed to the common man, right? So some technologies are operating at a scale where it impacts the common man deeply but does not necessarily have to be handed to the common man, right? So those technologies also exist and there is a millions of dollars of research there. Or research, for example, on uh, pharmaceuticals or modern drugs to overcome diseases that currently cannot be cured. That will not be handed to a common man, say epilepsy or things which we still don't know, how to cure depression, right? Uh, so I, I would not categorize a blanket statement which says all hundreds of millions of dollars of research, even if paid by the taxpayer, needs to be handed to the common man because there needs to be sometimes an agency that translates their research to the societal benefit. And that agency often is not only the individual. It could be some other agencies like uh, uh, a design software company uh, for earthquake protection. Does that answer your question? It's more complicated, no? Uh, I think policy is hugely important, particularly when we talk about people at the bottom of the planet. Uh, without support from policy to do something that helps people at the, at the bottom of the economic pyramid, uh, is a is a heavy lift uh, because then you have to rely purely on market forces uh, to, to, to bring in investments to go to scale otherwise it remains a voluntary effort which inevitably and necessarily cannot go to scale so uh, in other words voluntary effort has a critically important role in filling in the cracks in the system when they begin to fail for the poorest of the, the bottom of the economic pyramid. But to impact very large number of people, of, I'm talking about hundreds of millions of people at the India's economic base of the pyramid, you need something with agency, a stronger agency with wheels, with its own self-sustainability which will attract the necessary talent, pay adequate salaries, return margins to some pension fund that may invest in there. So ideally you would want something that is market based. At least it is social enterprise which means your rate of return is not high but still good enough for some pension funds or some other social investment to come in. Or you need some policy that encourages that. In my experience I have not waited for policy. Though long long ago I worked on it which was the case of promoting uh, compact fluorescent lamps in developing countries. Uh, and that was done without policy support, uh, but still had to engage with utilities. And that seems to have worked well again. But so it is not a voluntary effort in some sense. It still, but doesn't require government policy. Yet. But now in India, it is a government policy to have efficient light. So that's good. I think the best answer that I have is development is freedom from being forced to uh, forced to do unpleasant things from economic necessity. Okay. So economic necessity forces me to, for example, or possess somebody to maybe even be a bonded laborer or to push them into destitution or push them into physical activities that they find unbearably repugnant, then that is not development, obviously. So development 
gives you choices. Those choices allow you to allow you economic freedom. And then allow you to say, no, I don't want this, I want that. Right? So in some sense, be having more control on your destiny is developing. I think it's very easy. I don't think scientists and engineers I want to point fingers to as losing uh, losing track of the big picture. Uh, everybody can lose track of the big picture. It's not necessarily particular weakness of scientists and engineers. <laughs> so, sure, people can lose track of the big picture and people can forget who is at the receiving end of whatever that they are going to do. But that's human fallibility. What can you do? I, I guess one of the best things which I also cite to my students, in fact, is this quote from Gandhi, who says that whenever you are in doubt about your course of action, I'm paraphrasing, think about what effect it will have on the weakest member of society. And that will give you the right answer to the question of what choices you should make. That is indeed a good test if you think you want to work for helping people who are at the very bottom of the economic pyramid. No, you been said. I don't have to say anything new. It's a very good question. I have no idea how to bring more empathy among people. Uh, it's, I don't know how to teach it. And I don't know how how education system could help. Uh, there are people who believe that it is possible to do so, but I don't know how to do so. I think the easiest way to proceed is, particularly for Sitara, for example, is through self selection. Some people have more empathy, some people have less empathy. The people with less empathy, let them go and work in the stock market. It's fine, right? <laughs> People with more empathy work at Sitara. That's okay. Everybody do his own. Both sides will be happy, right? Uh, that's a hard question to answer. Uh, there have been so many satisfying and rewarding experiences. I think the thrill of inventing something, discovering something that will potentially have a very big positive impact, as well as the thrill of first time implementing something that actually shows a positive impact, or thrill of teaching somebody who says, aha, I get it. All those are, uh, one of the uh, indelible in my, in my mind uh, is the time when I was building my UV water disinfector. And I had no resources. All this work was done in evenings and weekends and borrowed equipment. And I built it, but I had no way to test it. So I obtained with some difficulty E. coli culture from the nutritional sciences lab and ran it through the disinfector. And now I have to incubate uh, the out product water to see if there is an E. coli growing. And I had no incubator. So uh, there is a particular test produced by IDEX labs uh, called Colular. So if you put that water in there and you incubate it at the right temperature, the water turns yellow if it has E. coli alive and remains clear if it has no E. coli. So I put a couple of those tubes with raw water and a couple of tubes with product water, seal them and put them on the top of the water heater which is kind of body temperature warm. It has to be incubated at something like 38. And next day morning, the tubes A and B were yellow and C and D were clear. That was fantastic. I said, oh my God, this works. <laughs> so sometimes you do with what you have, right? And you still may be able to have larger margins of confidence or larger confidence intervals because your equipment is a water heater top used as an incubator. So we are able to get some data.
I think there's a lot of work to do for sure. Uh, and I think the biggest reward, I'll start with that, is the satisfaction of having lived a life that you found some meaning. And that's, I think, the biggest satisfaction if you find this meaningful to you. Uh, the challenges are, of course, to find out in what niche you will find your place. It could be in a, in a development agency at a state level, it could be in a non-profit, or it could be a big international NGO, uh, or it could be in a lab, it could be in an academia. There's so many places that need this kind of innovation, talent, and passion for a better world. So, uh, but there's no clear trajectory that is laid out for you. So I guess the one challenge is to find out what, what you will do. But that is now much less of a challenge than it was say, 30 years ago, because multiple career paths are available. But it is still somewhat of a challenge. It's not so straightforward as if you do this, you just, just join this big company and then it's 